It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, good morning, Speaker. My first question is to the Premier. The Premier recently said that he would end hallway medicine by next summer. Is he on track? Huh. Questions addressed to the Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, we're well on our way. We're working hard to end hallway health care. As the Minister of Health has mentioned numerous, numerous times, one of the avenues, and there's many avenues, of ending hallway health care is making sure that we have long-term care beds. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we, we have committed to having 15,000 long-term care beds in the first five years, another 15,000 in the following five years. We're already, after a year and five months, well on our way with well over 7,500. I think it might even be closer to 8,000 uh, moving forward. That is one avenue. Working with the doctors, working with the, the nurses, they have, a, they have the ideas. We, we aren't super experts. My Minister of Health has become an expert, but we listen to the frontline doctors. Response. And every doctor I talk to, Mr. Speaker, has new ways of delivering health care more efficiently. Home care is another area that we have to focus on. Technology, Mr. Speaker, we have to focus on technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, today the Independent Financial Accountability Office released their report into long-term care. Their findings show that the government's plan for long-term care will leave the wait lists growing longer, oh. that we'll need almost four times as many beds as the government is planning just to keep the wait list at a horrendous 37,000 people. Oh. And without other changes in the health care sector, the problem of hallway medicine will get worse over the next two years. The Premier said he would end hallway medicine, the hallway medicine crisis that was created by the Liberals. Why is he taking things from bad to worse? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health. Well, thank you again uh, through you, Mr. Speaker. I would remind the Leader of the Official Opposition of several things. One is that we did not create the system of hallway health care. That's a system that's been growing for 15 years under the previous government. But we did promise the people of Ontario that we would do something about it, and we are. We have started. We promised the people of Ontario that we would create 15 new long-term care spaces within five years. We are on track to do that. My colleague, the Minister of Long-Term Care, is continuing the work that was started and doing an excellent job at it. We're working on that, but we also recognize that our seniors' population is growing rapidly. That's nothing new. I think everyone in this legislature knows that. And so we have to continue with our efforts. We promised 15,000 new spaces within five years, another 15,000 in five years thereafter. But we're also targeting Response. new and innovative innovative approaches, which I will speak with in the uh, supplemental. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Financial Accountability Officer is clear that the job of tackling hallway medicine is not going to be the walk in the park that the Premier promised. They pr the report uh, that he released today, or that their office released today, uh, indicates that even if the government keeps its, pro its promise, and that is a big if, the government keeps its promise. Wait lists for long-term care will continue to grow in our province, and hallway medicine will get worse. Is the Premier ready to admit that his plan to eliminate hallway medicine is falling short? Minister of Health. We made the people of Ontario a promise that we would end hallway health care, and we are going to do that. We are working on a number of approaches. There is no one simple approach to ending hallway health care. No one has ever suggested it's going to be a walk in the park. We need to build more long-term care spaces. That's clear. We have an unacceptably high number of people who are alternate level of care, patients in our hospitals who don't need to be there but have nowhere else to go. That is something we inherited, but it's something that we are dealing with. We also need to make sure that people who cycle in and out of hospital emergency departments with chronic mental health and addiction problems have the community care resources that they need. We are working on that in building our comprehensive connected mental health and addictions plan. Because what happens so often is that people who end up in a crisis with their mental health care or addictions care end up in hospital because there's no Response. other place for them to go. We want to create those places for them. And we want to create alternate types of spaces for people in our reactivation care centres where they can go, where they can be relocated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
The next question, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Premier as well, but I have to say, underfunding hospitals, forcing them to close beds and lay off frontline workers is not going to help with the hallway of medicine crisis that we have right now. But the government boasts, Speaker, that it increased spending in long-term care by $72 million this year. But the FAO report shows that this will not be Order. anywhere near enough. When beds are actually built, funding needs will increase. But the Ford government all is already moving in the opposite direction, Speaker, planning to cut $34 million in long-term care funding by next year. Does the Premier realize that cutting long-term care funding will make the wait times for long-term care even worse? The question has been addressed to the Premier. Minister of Long-Term Care. Referred to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. You know, we look back on 15 years of Liberal neglect in the long-term care sector, 15 years of runway that we would have been able to develop the beds and make that capacity and accessibility for those individuals needing in the community. That's 15 years. Our government has committed $1.75 billion for 15,000 beds over five years. Five years. This is a problem that has been a long time coming, and our government is committed. We've spent $72 million more this year over last year in long-term care. We're spending millions of dollars improving care in the community, and we're improving the integration of home care, community care, and our long-term care sector. So this was many years in the making. Our government is putting the money behind our commitment, $1.75 billion, Response. and that will be done. We are committed to doing that. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, there's no doubt the Liberals let the wait list for long-term care balloon by 78 per cent, Speaker, <coughs> over seven years. That is Order. a disgrace, and I think everybody in this chamber and everybody in Ontario would agree. But cutting $34 million next year is not going to help the problem, Speaker. They ignored the hallway medicine crisis. There's no doubt about it the last government did. But now the Ford government is carrying on the same uh, tradition, Speaker. The the FAO report is clear that the wait lists for long-term care are going to keep growing and that the challenges of hospital hallway medicine will go from bad to worse. When will this government admit that they need to do much, much more? Minister of Long-Term Care. The report from the FAO states that between 2011 and 2018, the number of long-term care beds in Ontario increased by only 0.8%, while the population of Ontarians aged 75 and over grew by 20%. I'm going to ask the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development to come to order. Even when you have your hand over your mouth like that, I can still hear that it's you. <laughs> because you're sitting very close to me. And I, I apologize to the Minister of Long-Term Care for having to interrupt her. So I am actually very pleased that the FAO recognizes our government's investments in long-term care, quote, is the largest new health care sector spending commitment in the 2019 budget and is a crucial part of the government's priority to end hallway health care. Our government is committing to make sure we can have residents in those long-term care beds when they need it and where they need it, and we are investing in that. I am working with the Ministry of Health and cross ministries to make sure that happens and streamlining processes to— Thank you very much. Well, Speaker, here's what families see. Hospital emergency rooms routinely operating at over 100 per cent capacity. Wait lists for long-term care that have more than doubled over the term of the Liberal government and have continued to grow under the Ford government. The FAO was very, very clear today, Speaker. This government's plan has us on, tra on track for longer wait lists for long-term care. It's in black and white. It's in the report. And he also says it's putting us in a, in a position to have even more hallway medicine. Speaker, why does the Premier think that this is acceptable? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you. 
To date, thank you for, uh, for that question and thank you, Speaker. To date, our government has allocated almost 8,000 new beds. We are well on our way to creating the capacity that is needed. But it's more than simply bricks and mortar. Long term care, people need it when they need it. We want to make sure that they get it when they need it. But we're also building capacities in the community with home care. And people want to stay in the community. They want to receive care in the community. So our capacity is building. We're already at 50 percent of what we have promised to commit to, and we are getting there. So we look at the FAO report. Estimated timing in March of 2021 is when our call for applications is to a design to address those remaining beds. So we are making really, really important progress. And I must admit, again, we've lost 15 years Response. of runway. The, our government is committed to making sure that the capacity is built, and I'm working again with multiple ministries to make sure that we achieve our goal. Thank you. The next question, again, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Yesterday, the Globe and Mail revealed more concerning news about the close ties between Mario Di Tommaso, the person hired by the Premier to oversee the appointment of a new OPP commissioner, and Ron Tavener, the person who Di Tommaso ultimately hired. We know, based on the Integrity Commissioner's report and extensive ongoing media investigations, that the process by which Mr. Tavener was appointed was flawed from day one, including the fact that Tavener was literally planning a party for the man who would hire him. Oh. When will the government start providing basic answers about what appears to be a glaring conflict of interest on the part of the person the Premier appointed to a senior role in the civil service? The question's been addressed to the Premier. Minister of Solicitor General. Referred to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I understand that the members opposite of the NDP want to continue to build a narrative about an individual who has served uh, in the OPS and in the Toronto Police Service. But I want to remind people that we have an excellent commissioner in Commissioner Creek with the OPP. The leadership that he has shown on mental health issues, on ensuring that the individuals who serve in our communities, protecting our families and our, our property, is doing incredible work. And I only hope that as the member opposite continues to see the excellent work that is coming out of the OPP Response. and the leadership there, that they will embrace the commissioner and assist him in his work in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. A supplementary question. Sure. This is not about a narrative. It's about a government that is been terrible, that has been Order. terrible with its appointments process, with the fishy appointments that it's made, with the lack of due process, the lack of transparency. That's what the questioning is all about, Speaker. This is just one of many concerning instances where the Ford government has appointed friends and insiders to key government roles. But this is especially troubling because it concerns Ontario's top policing job and the highest ranks of the civil service. Yesterday, the government house leader claimed that the government would be welcome to suggestions on how to improve the process by which people are appointed to uh, appoint important public offices in hopes of making it more you know, a, a transparent and open for the public. Well, we would like to take them up on this offer, Speaker. So will the Premier back our motion to have the Justice Committee Question. review the appointment process for the OPP Commissioner and ensure the committee hears directly from Deputy Minister Di Tommaso? The Solicitor General for to the government house leader. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, I think the Solicitor General was uh, was quite clear, uh, and uh, and I share her sentiments with respect to uh, Commissioner Karik. He's uh, somebody who served in York Region, and I know that the York Region Caucus are incredibly proud of his service to the people of York Region, and of course to the the to. Uh, the continuing service that he'll provide the people of Ontario with the OPP. But as I said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, there was more coming with respect to improving openness and transparency uh, for our public appointment uh, process. I would suspect that all members of this legislature would, would want that. So we have made some, some important changes. We've looked at uh, some of the recommendations through what the, that the Auditor General brought forward. We've added some cooling off provisions with respect to special advisors, as you know, as colleagues will know. 
Uh, that's something that the Auditor General brought forward. We've increasing transparency. We're incre enhancing conflict of interest uh, uh, assessments. Some of these appointments will be referred to the Integrity Commissioner. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, so these are all important Response. appointments. Of course, special advisors will now be posted publicly, so these are important changes, Mr. Speaker, and I hope the opposition will support them. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, as you know, our government was elected on a promise to help turn our province around economically. For far too long, Ontario was always having to play economic catch-up when it came to the rest of Canada and even North America. The previous economic policies in place caused fiscal stagnation while limiting job prospects and economic potential for families, small and medium business owners in my riding and throughout our province. Since our election, our main focus has been to put in place policies and regulations that will lead the way for economic expansion. Premier, can you elaborate on the positive impact that our policies have had economically in our province under your watch. Great. The question is to the Premier. Well, I'd like to thank my all-star colleague from Brampton West, absolute champion. Things are booming Order. in Brampton. And that, through you, Mr. Speaker, under our watch, we have helped create an economic conditions for 272,000 jobs. That's 272,000 jobs. That's the size of Windsor. That's the size of almost Vaughan employing people. TD Economics recently published a great report that describes in detail Ontario's economic output for just a year alone. Mr. Speaker, only five times since 1981, almost 40 years, has there been at least three quarters in which the economy has created jobs at a faster pace than output has ex expanded. 80,000 new self-employed positions created have created this year alone. So these are true entrepreneurs going out there creating more jobs, Mr. Speaker. Lots. And Mr. Speaker, the report even goes and, and states, we have hired 41,000 new public sector jobs, so much for laying people off. There are 41,000 people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Premier, those are incredible numbers and shows what can be accomplished by the ingenuity and innovation of the people of Ontario themselves. It is refreshing that we finally have a it now appears as a ventriloquist on this side of the House, and I suspect it's the member for Hamilton East Stony Creek, and I would ask him to come to order. I apologize to the member for Brampton West, who has the floor. It is refreshing that we finally have a government that supports job creators instead of punishes them and works with them instead of against them. I know that both yourself and the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade have been have major supporters of the Open for Business strategy and in welcoming new Ontarians to our economic sector. Can you elaborate on the continuing positive impact that immigration has had on the economic success experienced in this province? Premier to reply. Well, thank you very, very much, our great MPP from Brampton. I can tell you, as I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, we created 272,000 jobs, and our biggest problem right now we don't have enough people here in Ontario to fill the additional 200,000 jobs that are out there. And in Ontario alone, the first half of this year, over 65,000 immigrants settled in Ontario. That's 50% being classified as coming on economic grounds. So we're getting some of the brightest people here in Ontario. But my call out to the world, my call out to the world, you want to work, you want to contribute back to Ontario, come to Ontario. We have jobs. Our economy will continue to boom as long as we have the people to fill the production output of these companies that they're facing. We're going to continue on this economic growth. We're leading North America. Response. We are on fire because of the policies of this great party. And I can tell you what a great announcement yesterday, $100 million from DHL, right in the leader of the opposition's uh, backyard. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock.
I'm going to remind all members that when the speaker stands, your microphone is cut off, and that's a signal that you should sit down because your time is up. I've stopped the clock. Please restart the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For parents raising a child with autism, the last year of this government's failed policies has been a nightmare. Last night, we learned that the government's panel has submitted their recommendations. For months, even years, parents have been calling for a needs-based program, and now even the government's own panel is calling for the same. Will the Premier commit right now to make the OAP available based on a child's need and provide the funding to ensure that no child is left to languish on wait lists? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Community and Social Services. Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, an honour to rise for the first time in this House as the Minister for Children, Community and Social Services and uh, take a question from my uh, opposition critic today. Um, I want to thank the members of the expert panel, the Ontario Autism Panel, who worked uh, tirelessly uh, throughout the summer, Mr. Speaker. They met uh, 18 different times face-to-face, -face, and these weren't just one-hour meetings, Mr. Speaker. These were all-day sessions where they came together uh, from various points of view, uh, parents with lived experience, adults with lived experience with autism, uh, other uh, clinicians and therapists and people from academia to come together to develop the foundation for a new Ontario autism program here in Ontario, Response. something that people have been waiting for for a long, long time. I'm very proud of the work that they've done. I want to thank them for the work that they've done. Many of them are here today, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that the minister is happy with the recommendations. I hope that he'll be implementing them immediately. Children have waited months and months because of the Ford government's failed autism program cuts and their constant refusal to listen to parents. They shouldn't have to wait a minute longer. Every day that goes by without services is a day that a child's developmental potential is put further behind. Life is getting harder and harder for families scrounging to pay for expensive therapy out of pocket. How much longer? Will families have to wait to get the help they need and have been promised? Here, here. Minister. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I received a draft copy of the recommendations from the panel last night. I know that the panel's report is now public and it's online for the entire community to view. I know that this program has been developed by the community for the autism community. I'm very, very proud of that, and it's the first time in the province's history that this type of consultation has ever happened. So again, I want to thank them for the work that they've done. The other the other important piece to this, Mr. Speaker, and for those of you who have been paying attention, uh, back in July, I actually gave the panel some new guidelines to work within. The previous Liberal government funded autism to the tune of $300 million, Mr. Speaker. Under Premier Ford and our government, that has doubled to $600 million. So I look forward to looking at the full report later today with my team. I know the community is going to want to provide input. There's a lot of great strides that have been made thanks to the work Response. of this expert panel, and I know they're waiting for us to implement this as soon as we possibly can. Mr. Speaker, again, I just want to thank the members who are here and the members who worked all summer on this proposal. Thank, thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. According to the World Health Organization, growing vaccine hesitancy is one of the top 10 threats to global health. In Canada, an estimated 20 per cent of parents are vaccine hesitant. And what that means, Mr. Speaker, is that one in five families may choose not to have their children vaccinated against measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, tetanus, polio, whooping cough, meningitis, or chickenpox. And that is what threatens, as the minister knows, the herd immunity that is protected generations of Canadians, including hers and mine. 
Er earlier this month, the Toronto Board of Health accepted the September 2019 report of the Medical Officer of Health and its strategy to address vaccine hesitancy. And the strategy calls on the provincial government to follow the advice of the Premier's own council to, among other recommendations, improve immunization information sharing, set immunization targets for Ontario health teams, provide financial incentives to promote vaccinations Question. for local health providers. In February of this year, the minister said that she was concerned about uh, vaccine skeptics, and yet in September last month, just last month, she said that the government has no plans to update the province's approach. So I asked the minister, will she reconsider, and will she in fact follow the advice of the Premier's Council, and if not, why not? Thank you. The question is to the Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. It is a serious concern. I am concerned about the uh, lower levels of vaccinations that we're seeing. As a matter of fact, I just received my own flu vaccine this morning, and we did some uh, publications, some uh, announcements about it. We do have a, a provincial-wide uh, advisory that's going out. At urging people to receive vaccinations. Last year, we know that over 5,000 people were hospitalized because of not getting the flu vaccine and ending up in hospital. What I don't think that people realize is that the flu, in particular, can be deadly. People die because of the flu, and we want to encourage people. I am encouraging everyone to please get the flu vaccine. It's important for your own health and safety, and it's important for the health and safety of those around you. We do have that herd immunity. We do need to have a high level of people vaccinated in this province. So I urge people to reconsider. If you have any hesitancy about it, please get the correct information. Getting the flu vaccine, in particular I was speaking about today, is very, very important. It's absolutely Response. safe, it's free, and it's readily available. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. And I certainly agree with the minister on the flu vaccine, but I'm actually talking about the broad range of vaccinations, particularly the childhood vaccinations that are so important. And one of the ways in which vaccination rates can be improved is to tighten or eliminate the restrictions on non-medical exemptions. And I know this is highly contentious. I know it's difficult, uh, Mr. Speaker, but there are other jurisdictions, New Brunswick, California, Mississippi, West Virginia, Maine, New York, that are already moving to or have already put in place a prohibition on non-medical exemptions. In other words, a family can still get an exemption from a vaccination, but only for medical reasons. And there's evidence from the United States, United States jurisdictions that where non-medical exemptions have been removed, levels of immunization coverage goes up. My personal opinion, um, Mr. Speaker, is that Vaccinations have been so successful Question. that there is a generation of people who do not know what can happen if you get measles, if you get mumps, rubella. What our generation had to do was we just had to get those diseases and build up our own immune system if we could. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister? Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I will say to the member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, we don't need the buzzer. I would ask the Minister of Health to reply. Well, I, I certainly agree with the member that there is a whole generation of people that don't understand the importance of vaccinations, and that's where I think the education piece is so important. Our provincial campaign with respect to the flu vaccine, but with respect to other vaccinations, is really, really important to remind people that they can become very ill or they can make other people very ill if they don't get vaccinated. So my preference is to proceed with a more robust education campaign. I understand that the non-medical exemption has been a very contentious, but there is a very small number of people that rely on that. We have no intention of, of subverting people's religious concerns. There are some people that have true religious concerns with respect to vaccinations. I believe that we should respect that. It is a very small number of people, though, among the group that choose not to be vaccinated. The larger group is the people that Response. there's a lot of myths and misunderstandings with respect to vaccinations. I believe it's important to educate people on the actual reality and the importance of being vaccinated. It's for your own health and for the health of Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Yesterday, the Solicitor General introduced the Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act, or the PAWS Act for short. This comes after the Ontario Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals ended its 100-year role as the enforcement agency of Ontario's animal welfare legislation. 
Our government stepped up with an interim solution to protect animals in the short term while we consulted with animal welfare stakeholders in order to inform the permanent solution we developed. Can the minister please tell this House how the PAWS Act will help ensure that animals remain protected in the long term? Just to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Kitchener-Conestoga. You know, there's uh, many of us in this chamber who feel very strongly that there were opportunities in Ontario to strengthen the animal welfare protection system, and I believe that we have done that with the introduction of PAWS. So what we are uh, proposing, if passed, will actually ensure that Ontario has the strongest animal protection welfare in Canada. And I'm proud of that work. I'm proud of the assistance that my parliamentary assistants and other uh, colleagues in the chamber who have brought forward private members' bill have participated in this process. It is vitally important that we get this legislation right, and I am pleased with where we have landed with the PAWS Act, and I hope that going forward we can have the support of all members in the, in the legislature because I think we understand the importance and value of protecting the animals that we live and love with. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, through, through you, Speaker, I'd like to thank the Solicitor General for her answer. It is great to hear that if passed, the PAWS Act will implement the strongest fines for offenders in Canada. With over 60 per cent of Ontario households having at least one pet, I know that animal welfare is a pressing issue for many of us. With substantial public interest and a diverse group of stakeholders, public consultation is critical for the development of a new animal welfare system to build public trust. Can the Solicitor General outline to this House what consultations went into developing the PAWS Act? The Solicitor General reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. You know, there was, uh, as, I, as I mentioned previously, there was a lot of interest in this issue. In the three short weeks that we had public consultation open, we had 16,000 individual members wow. of the public uh, participate and get involved. But in, in addition to that, we had round tables with, with colleagues and uh, caucus members. Uh, we involved and engaged in local humane societies, the uh, municipalities, the police services. Uh, veterinarians. There are a lot of players in this uh, field who are very, very interested in ensuring that we get the balance right. And uh, I believe when members opposite have had an opportunity to review the PAWS Act, uh, they will see the input and engagement was large and fulsome, and the interim model has been a successful um, process. Response. We, we intend to expand that, uh, and I would encourage people to uh, to use the 18339 animal if they see any animal in distress or have concerns. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, for months, the Premier has insisted that his government's appointment process is above board. Even after appointee after appointee has been forced to resign amidst evidence of cronyism and scandal. But the Premier's attempt to make his close personal friend OPP commissioner and appoint his close personal friend to the civil service so that he could run the hiring process, that stinks pretty badly, Speaker, even by this government's standards. Speaker, will the Premier I'm going to caution the member on his language and ask him to rephrase his question. I am going to caution the member on his language and ask him to rephrase his question. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. Uh, Speaker, the Premier has an opportunity to set the record straight here today. Will he let the Justice Committee hear from the Deputy Minister? Questions addressed to the Premier. House Leader. Uh, thank to the you, government. Thank House You know, Mr. Speaker, what's disappointing? What's disappointing is hearing from the members opposite, who are trying to somehow impugn the uh, uh, the work that these two individuals have done. We're talking about a, an officer, a police officer, who many, many years of services. Two individuals who have served the province of Ontario exceptionally well for many, many years, Mr. Speaker. I think we should celebrate those type of individuals, not take it to the floor of the legislature and bring those types of individuals down. But at the same time, we said we want to improve the appointments process. We took a look at what the Auditor General had to say, 
and we are making changes. I highlighted some of those changes in, in an earlier answer, Mr. Speaker, including adding a cooling off uh, uh, period for special advisors. That was a recommendation of the Auditor General. I hope the opposition will support that, Mr. Speaker. We have some additional uh, uh, transparency uh, uh, measures that we're bringing forward, Mr. Speaker. We're seeking some comment from the chairs of the different boards so that we can update the skill sets uh, of uh, individuals that we're appointing. These are people who do very good work for the people of the province of Ontario, and they certainly don't be uh, they don't deserve to be talked down to by the members of the opposition. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the purpose of this committee is to look at what happened at every step of this widely criticized process, to be, in the words of the House Leader, open and transparent. But by refusing to cooperate, the Premier is telling Ontarians that the transparency that they're looking for is just too much to ask from him. If the Premier really wants to correct his disastrous first year in office, it's going to take more than simply throwing his chief of staff under the bus. Will the Premier show that he's actually committed to the openness and transparency transparency that he likes to talk about and allow us to hear from his deputy minister about this deeply flawed process. The question has been referred to the government house leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, obviously, uh, committees are, are the, uh, the masters of their own uh, domain, Mr. Speaker, and we'll let them make that decision on their own. Uh, at the same time, as I said, we've brought in a number of transparency measures. We're improving the public appointment process. I would hope that all members of the legislature want to continuously improve that process. I know that on our side of the House, we are doing that always. Our ministers are working hard. Our, our, our members of uh, provincial parliament are all working hard to improve the public appointment process. I've highlighted some of the things that we're doing, but the member opposite talks about a disastrous first year in government. A disastrous first year? Tell that to the 280,000 people who are working that weren't working before. Tell that to the people of the city of Toronto who will be going on subways after years and years of not being able to do that. Tell that to the people who will have a long-term care bed for the first time in generations, Mr. Speaker. I would say that the first year in government for us has been spectacular, but it's been even more important and more impressive for the people of Order. Ontario who are working, who are paying fewer taxes, Spons. who have better schools, who have better long-term care facilities, who will have subways, who have better roads, transit and transportation. I would say the first you was a huge success. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. I am very concerned with FAO report as well. It is just released this morning. It is disappointing that over the last 15 years, the long-term care system was simply inactive. It is reported that between 2011 and 2018, the number of long-term care beds in Ontario increased by only 0.8 per cent. When the population of Ontarians aged 75 and over grew by 20 per cent, this number is simply unacceptable to me. People in my riding are waiting to get into long-term care, and they simply aren't able to. Minister. Can you tell me more how our government is taking a different approach and acting in the best interest of Ontarians to get these beds built? Questions addressed to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Richmond Hill for bringing this to light. I also want to thank the Financial Accountability Officer for Ontario for his very comprehensive review of our plan. Uh, this report confirms that the previous government ignored the long-term care system, and that our plan is headed in the right direction. Here, here. In contrast to what wasn't done in the last 15 years, our government is investing $1.75 billion 
to create 15,000 new long-term care beds and redevelop another 15,000 to long-term care uh, to modern design standards. And in addition to that, $72 million more this year compared to last year to go to long-term care. So this is to support more beds, more nursing, more personal support care. Really looking at helping our residents get the Response. care they need when they need it. Mr. Speaker, those are real dollars. Real investment and a vision for a 21st century long-term care system will get the capacity and our residents the care they need. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the Minister, for your encouraging answer. Wow. 30,000 new and redeveloped long-term care beds. This is exactly the real investment that we're looking for. Community, communities across the province and the countless families will see their loved ones being cared for after all this long wait. After the 15 years of neglect and a long-term care system by the Liberals, this is a major improvement. Building more beds and redeveloping older beds will help relieve pressures on the hospital system, and we work to end the, health, the hallway health care. But I know that we need real relief in the long-term care system as soon as possible. Minister, Question. along the investment you just spoke about, what further action is the government taking to make beds into long-term care system? Mr. Long -term care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. And to date, our government has already allocated almost 8,000 beds to long-term care. Those are that's moving in the right direction. That is towards our 15,000 new bed commitment. In addition, we have started accepting applications from current and future potential long-term care operators to build new long-term care beds and redevelop existing ones across Ontario. And just this morning, the FAO validated our commitment to have these 15,000 beds built within five years. However, we are actively engaging with our long-term care sector to modernize development processes by reducing red tape, streamlining processes, and creating greater flexibility in, in expediting our processes. So we're putting shovels in the ground faster, and we'll get people into those beds faster. Response. But we know our work has only just begun. Our government is committed to creating the capacity in long-term care, and together we can improve long-term care for all Ontarians. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Kitchener-Waterloo is an established innovation hub in Ontario. Tech companies in my riding create thousands of good jobs and drive our economy. But across the province, we've seen funding cuts to tech and research groups by this Conservative government. The latest on the chopping block is the University of Waterloo's Institute for Quantum Computing. This move puts good jobs and economic opportunities at risk due to short-sighted cuts from this Conservative government. This now jeopardizes our competitive advantage as a province. Will the Premier reverse this harmful decision for Waterloo and Kitchener-Waterloo? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Economic Development. To the Minister of Economic Development. Job Thank you, Speaker. We are indeed committed to ensuring Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. We have ongoing conversations with the tech sector about creating the conditions that will continue to allow companies to scale up and grow. And we continue to work with and support the tech sector because when our tech jobs thrive, our communities thrive. In September, our government announced we are investing nearly $41 million in 174 research projects across the province as part of Ontario's Open for Business, Open for Jobs plan. In fact, Waterloo University received 14 grants, totaling over $2 million, wow. that will go towards funding research projects in quantum computing and other high-tech sectors. We will continue to Response. work with the industry to ensure innovative business environment protects the workers, builds capacity, creates jobs, opportunity, and growth. Good job. 
Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In part, the reason why Waterloo and Canada are on the map for quantum computing is because we invested early and we invested often. Ontario has been a leader in this country investing in areas like quantum computing, computing AI, and medical research, including cancer research. But since this PC government has been elected, the research sector has seen cut after cut after cut. And when a pattern of defunding emerges, it becomes more difficult to market the province as a leader in business and research. Does the Premier of Ontario really believe he is on the right track? Questions been referred to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we've seen job after job after job. In fact, 272,400 of them have been created. Our government understands the value of quantum computing and AI across multiple sectors in Ontario. We have over 300 AI-enabled firms and institutions Order. in Ontario, and we continue with our plan to protect good jobs in the tech sector today while investing in the skills and technology essential to remain competitive tomorrow. We have nearly 300,000 tech workers in Ontario today. That puts Ontario as the second largest IT cluster in all of North America. Quantum computing and AI will have enormous economic impacts thanks to our investments. By 2035, it is estimated that AI will add more than $14 trillion to the global economy. And Speaker, that is why our government remains committed to investing in quantum computing, facilitating an environment where the tech and the AI sectors can continue to grow and thrive. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Yesterday marked a momentous day for public transit in the province of Ontario, and I want to offer my personal congratulations to the Minister for receiving Toronto City Council's endorsement of her four priority subway projects. You know, the Minister took over this portfolio just over 100 days ago and has successfully built on the foundation built by her predecessor. Our four priority projects will deliver rapid transit to communities that need it, like Flemington Park. Thorncliffe and Liberty Village, which will all directly benefit from the Ontario Line, and Scarborough, which will finally have the three-stop subway line that they deserve. Can the Minister please explain what yesterday's City Council vote means for the people of Ontario and Toronto? question is to the Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the member from Willowdale for his question and his uh, very kind comments. I was happy to take over this ministry, which is left in great shape by my colleague, Minister Europe. And I have been very lucky to be working alongside the Associate Minister of Transportation, Minister Surma, who knows and understands the transit needs in the GTA. Speaker, this is a defining moment for public transit in Toronto. The City of Toronto and the Province of Ontario have endorsed one single unified plan for subway expansion in Toronto. I am grateful that City Council has endorsed our proposal of October 10th. This is a testament to the commitment of our Premier and the Mayor Response. to get transit built. In order to paraphrase the Premier, what is good for Ontario, uh, good for Toronto, is good for Ontario. Gridlock, and we are one step closer to delivering public transit. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you for that, Minister. Our government's goal has always been to improve transit and to get Ontario moving. This region loses $11 billion a year to gridlock, a fact that is all too well known in Willowdale. We recognize the urgency of building the transit network that our province needs. Our four priority projects, the Young North Extension, the Three Stop Scarborough Extension, the Eglinton West Extension, and the Ontario Line will provide the relief that my constituents and all Ontarians need and deserve. Yesterday's council vote was crucial, but there is plenty of work ahead of us. Through you, Speaker, can the minister tell us what's next? Mm. Minister of Transportation. 
I'm very happy to speak to answer that question. We have been clear from the onset that our plan is ambitious and attainable. With City Council's support, the province has begun a new era of cooperation and partnership with the City of Toronto that will turn our government's transit plan into a reality. Now, the federal government must view our transit plan as the urgent priority that it is. I'm calling on Prime Minister Trudeau to fulfill his, his campaign promise and commit his full 40 per cent funding share to get these projects built. I'm calling on the Prime Minister to respect his electoral promise for him to fund up to 40 per cent this project. We are making serious headway on getting subways built in Toronto. The train Response. is leaving the station. We are building transit for the future. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Okay. I'm sorry, Speaker, I couldn't hear you. My question is for the Premier. Last year, this government voted against building 2,000 new not-for-profit long-term care spaces in Scarborough, Whitby and Oshawa. Under the previous Liberal government, wait times to access long-term care in Durham region grew to be among the longest in the province. That was the Liberals. Under this government, wait times have grown longer. We've gone from bad to worse. I hear it regularly from families in my riding. I have been listening to families who are desperate on behalf of their loved ones. This is unacceptable. Why does the Premier think it is acceptable for seniors and their families to wait years on end to find an appropriate place to live and to receive the care that they deserve? The question is addressed to the Premier. The Minister of Long-Term Care. Prior to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our, our government is committed to building a 21st century long-term care system to meet the vital needs of our long-term care growing population. We are investing $1.75 billion over five years to create that new capacity. 15,000 new beds, 15,000 beds to be developed to modern design standards. And we have already allocated almost 2,000 of those beds new, reaffirmed, another 6,085. So we're one step closer to fulfilling this commitment, and our recent call for applications on October 1st from current and potential long-term care home operators to build new long-term care beds and redevelop long-term care beds is part of our commitment. So we're modernizing long-term care and adding $72 million more this year than the year before. And with an aging population, these new and redeveloped beds will help more families. And Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Premier. As of this past September, there were nearly 1,500 people waiting to get a room at the long term care home Hillsdale Estates in my riding of Oshawa. They will be waiting for over a year, and that is the best case scenario, and that's for a shared room. It is years and years and years for a private room. In Whitby, there are over 1,700 people waiting for a room at Fairview Lodge Long-Term Care Home. Over 1,400 people are waiting for a room at the village of Taunton Mills. Under the Liberals, waitlists skyrocketed due to years of underfunding and willful neglect. Under this government, under this Conservative government, as we learned today from the FAO report, those waitlists will only get longer. Why is the Premier allowing seniors to languish on ballooning long-term care waitlists just like the Liberals did before him? The question has been referred to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. You know, I want to thank you for raising that concern with me. We want to hear from our sector, and we have been hearing from our sector over the last few months. And so our government knows that some facilities in the province are facing very long wait times, and they have issues that we need to help them resolve. And we're committed to building a long-term care system for the 21st century so that our most vulnerable people can get the care that they need when and where they need it. And that means ensuring that each and every long-term care home in Ontario is fulfilling its potential. So I want to assure the member opposite that I will be looking into that and I will ensure that my office will be following up with you regarding that. We want to work with Response. our sector, and I appreciate you bringing forward that concern. Thank you. 
The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Minister, yesterday I was thrilled to see the Toronto City Council voted to approve our subway plan. As someone who takes the subway daily, I know that it will reduce overcrowding on Line 1, and I may finally get a seat. <laughs> After years of political squabbling, it's great to see that the province is moving forward together with the city to finally build new transit. Can the minister please tell us more about this historic arrangement between the city and the province of Ontario? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much to the member for the question. Yesterday was truly a historic day for the people of Toronto. The city and the province came together to finally bring relief for families and provide the service that the great people of the city deserve. City Council approved our transit plan, which includes four priority transit projects, our Ontario Line, our three-stop Scarborough Subway, our Young Extension North, and of course, the Eglinton Crosstown, which will be predominantly built underground. With this agreement in place, we are making a commitment to the people of Toronto that we will work together to build subways as quickly as possible. We will now be building and extending subways in the west and east ends of the city, connecting them to the downtown core. Yesterday's council decision confirmed that we can now have discussions with the federal government with, uh, with a true partnership with the city of Toronto. This is a great day for Response. the city of Toronto, the province of Ontario, but most importantly, Mr. Speaker, it's a great day for the taxpayer. Great day. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I agree with the minister when she says that it's a great day for Toronto, and it's a great day for our entire region. When I talk to people in New York Centre, they don't want to hear more excuses or delays when it comes to building transit. All they want is to see progress, shovels in the ground, and ultimately, new stations built. Speaker, could the minister please share more about our proposed projects and how they'll benefit local transit riders? Thank you very much uh, for the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned before, we will finally be bringing relief uh, to families in the west end and the east end of the city. Our Ontario line is 15 kilometers in length, and it is double the distance of the previously proposed uh, city downtown relief line. And anyone that takes the subway knows how busy the young line is, Mr. Speaker, and that's why it's important to highlight that the Ontario line will be reducing crowding on the Young line by 14 per cent, reducing crowding at Bloor and Young Station by 17 per cent, and reducing crowding at Union Station by 13 per cent. The, uh, the Ontario line will also run north of Pape to the Science Centre, serving communities uh, along the way. Mr. Speaker, it's been an absolute pleasure to work at the Ministry of Transportation on this initiative, Response. and I look forward to continuing the good work. Great job. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last year, this Conservative government voted against building 2,000 new not-for-profit long-term uh, spaces in Scarborough and Durham region. You all know this. You voted against it last year. We learned that today that by the FAO report that the number uh, of people waiting for long-term long -term care beds grew by nearly 78 percent under the previous Liberal government, and that wait list is Order. and that wait list is expected to grow under this Conservative government. Premier, my people in Scarborough have waited long enough. So under, under the Liberal government, and now they're going to wait under this Conservative government. Why is this Conservative government taking it from bad to worse? The question has been addressed to the Premier. Minister of Long-Term Care again. Referred to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member opposite for, the, for addressing that issue. For the first time in Ontario's history, we are prioritizing the long-term care sector and making long-term care residents and caregivers a priority. So we recognize that there has been a significant increase in the need for long-term care beds. And that's why we're investing $1.75 billion over the next five years to improve access to the long-term care system by creating 15,000 new long-term care beds and redeveloping another 15,000 uh, beds to, uh, to modern design standards. And we're adding $72 million more this year than last year. 
Building more beds, rede redeveloping older beds will help address the pressures in hospital. The hallway health care issue is growing. We understand that. But this is an important step to ending hallway health care and ensuring that every Ontarian who needs it can access our long-term care system. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. No, Minister, the, the, you're making a cut of $35 million. S Speaker, my question is back to the Premier. Does the Premier know what happens when someone falls in a long-term care home, in, in the washroom, for example? They wait about five to ten minutes, lying on the floor, because there is not enough people in those long-term care homes to help when they press that buzzer. That's what happens in Scarborough. Scarborough has some of the longest wait times for long-term care beds in the province because of the previous Liberal government's underfunding. Wait lists will only get longer under this Conservative government, and we know this from the FAO report. Speaker, there are already 3,000 people waiting for long-term care beds in the Monshong Long-Term Care Centre in Scarborough. So will this minister admit and commit that they're not doing the same thing as the previous Liberal government and they will do a better job, or are they keeping up with what the Liberals did and just making it worse? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for that concern. Our government has been absolutely transparent about the need to increase access to long-term care, and we know it will take a cross-ministry approach to serve people better. And while we work to improve our system, we will continue to invest. We have not cut $34 million from long-term care. We are also working with industry partners to streamline processes and make sure we get shovels in the ground faster and those beds built. Thank you. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, municipalities, the federal and provincial governments <laughs> must work together to ensure our constituents have safe roads, bridges, and transit. This summer, I had the pleasure of sharing details of the local investments our government is making in Perry Sound, Muskoka. $1.2 million improvements to Dillon Road in the community of Harlem. In Huntsville, we're investing $267,000 for the replacement of the Etwell Bridge and more than $122,000 for phase one of their trans transit ridership growth plan. I'm also pleased that our government is investing more than $337,000 for the replacement of Snyder's Bay Bridge in Gravenhurst. Can the minister tell this House if the province will continue to make these important investments in our communities? Good question. The question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. From Perry Sam Muskoka for his hard work on behalf of his constituents and his contribution to our government. And it is our government is and will continue to work together with municipalities, families, businesses to make smart investments in our infrastructure and keep it reliable for the people of Ontario. Our government is committed to making these investments, and I can assure the member we will continue these important investments. Investments like over $851,000 for the replacement of Black Bridge in the town of Bracebridge, and the more than $900,000 for road reconstruction and Wasaking First Nation. Ontario has committed infrastructure funding valued at more than $4.5 million in communities across Perry Sound, Muskoka. To date, Mr. Speaker, Ontario has nominated 144 projects of road, bridge and air through the rural and northern funding stream, Mr. Speaker, a total of $115 million in provincial funding, and we're just waiting for the federal government to approve Response. these projects that have been nominated by the municipalities and the provincial government. Thank you very much. That concludes question period today. Is it a point of order? Before I entertain any points of order, I'm going to um, point out that we have had ample time to introduce visitors this morning before question period. We're not going to be entertaining points of order after question period to introduce visitors anymore. But the, the Associate Minister for Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to invite all of my colleagues from the House to join us for a picture on the stairs in honour of Child Abuse Prevention Month That's after question period. Thank you. Thank you very much. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.